there is no such thing as someone who came into Bitcoin fully convinced and wasn't a skeptic. Uh, and, and that shouldn't be the case. Um, we should all be skeptics, right, at first, because what we're talking about is something that defies many of our expectations and beliefs. Even Satoshi Nakamoto was a skeptic. Um, they didn't come in and say, this is going to work. They came in and say, well, this might work. And if it did work, here's how it might play out. And they didn't make all of those predictions correctly. Every single person after that came in with, I have a lot of questions about how this could go wrong. Hello, everybody. Simon Dixon here, and welcome to the fifth episode of Bitcoin Hard Talk, where we give hard talk about the hardest form of money. Um, I wanted to do an episode on all the reasons why you should not buy Bitcoin. I like to give a balanced view, um, not just the bull case, and it's very easy to always get caught in the bull case, but what can go wrong with Bitcoin? And there's certain things that have come up over the years, some genuine objections, um, some which are just misguided and some that have just been proven wrong just by experimentation and experience over time. And so in this episode, what I wanted to do is cover um, some of the different political scenarios and also cover the technical reactions as a result of some of these common you know, objections to why Bitcoin might fail. In order to do that, because I've got different ideas and different theories I wanted to bring somebody in that could answer some of the more technical questions. Uh, you all know that I'm a finance guy that got pushed into technology and found technology. Um, but I wanted to get a technical guy that's also good at thinking about some of the political and technicals. And really, when that came up, there was only one person I had in mind. And that's really my go-to expert whenever I want to learn something technical and have somebody that can actually explain really technical, complex subjects in a real easy and uh, understandable way with a bit of philosophy um, and also a bit of politics injected in. And to me, there's only one guy that came to mind, and that's Andreas Antonopoulos. Andreas is the author of Mastering Bitcoin, Mastering Ethereum, and the Internet of Money. Um, he's a technical guy, but he's also very proficient in both the philosophy, the politics, and the technical side um, of Bitcoin. He's been around since 2012, so he's seen all these different things play out over the years. And really, Andreas has often been the first person that people come across, um, certainly in the earlier days uh, when they discover Bitcoin. Um, the reason for that is because he has a real gift as an educator um, to actually articulate different schools of thoughts and educate people and is responsible for more people getting into Bitcoin than many people I know. So the first thing you probably think is this is meant to be Bitcoin hard talk. So why do you have somebody that's not going to give hard objections uh, to Bitcoin? Well, we really tried to tackle some of those issues. So we covered all the common objections, whether it be quantum computing, whether it be making Bitcoin illegal, whether it could be mining centralization. Um, and we covered all of the common things that would really stop someone from getting into Bitcoin and play out different scenarios. I'll cover more of the political financial side and Andreas will jump in with the technical and then we'll come up with a general philosophy. And we end the recording with what we consider to be the biggest risks to Bitcoin. Now, I do want to warn you, sometimes Andreas can get pretty technical, but I challenge you to persist through that because at the end, we cover all of these and we bring it all together into simple to understand different scenarios that everyday people that may not be so technically gifted and as Andreas can understand. So just push through the technical jargon and we'll see you on the other side. Okay, so I'm really excited to be doing this. Um, you know, Andreas and I, myself have crossed paths in many different environments um, across the years. Um, and finally, we get to create some content together. Um, and I was thinking to myself, what is the, the best thing that uh, Andreas and myself could do? And I think with, uh, you know, at the, at the current stage at the moment, um, there's lots of new people. We're in an, a, a new adoption cycle where lots of new people are coming in. Um, and throughout the years, we've pretty much seen every single reason or every single objection that one could give. 
um, to not wanting to be involved in Bitcoin or the same things that people have. Um, and what I wanted to do in this is um, cover some of those objectives. And I want to do it from the perspective of not just you know, always thinking of the bullish case uh, for why people should be involved in Bitcoin and what, what can happen, um, but also just tackle some of the genuine risks and what are real risks, what are fake risks. Um, and so in doing that, uh, I thought Andreas is probably the person that I would go to if I ever wanted some of the technical perspective, not just simply because um, he knows the technology, but because he can also communicate um, and help people understand. And I think, edu uh, Andreas, you like to think of yourself um, as an educator, and I think you've done a great job educating in this space. Um, oh, thank you. I, I think of myself as the greeter, the Bitcoin greeter that meets you uh, when you come in and like, hello, folks, welcome to Bitcoin. How can I help you find something today? Uh, the funny thing is that the journey you described, which is overcoming all of these risks and objections, it's not, it's not something that only newbies um, go through. Um, I think it's something everyone in Bitcoin goes through. So there is no such thing as someone who came into Bitcoin fully convinced and wasn't a skeptic. Uh, and, and, and that shouldn't be the case. Um, we should all be skeptics, right, at first. Because what we're talking about is something that defies many of our expectations and beliefs. Even Satoshi Nakamoto was a skeptic. Um, they didn't come in and say, this is going to work. They came in and say, well, this might work. And if it did work, here's how it might play out. And they didn't make all of those predictions correctly. Every single person after that came in with, I have a lot of questions about how this could go wrong. Um, and the process of becoming um, kind of persuaded about the robustness of this system comes from two parts experience. The, the first one is, um, as you're thinking and understanding more and more of this system, these, these little fears pop up, these little risks. And you're like, huh, I wonder if, if this happened, could that be the Achilles heel? Where, what's the catch here? And, and you come up with these risks. Um, and so gradually overcoming those and understanding, oh, well, no, that wouldn't actually work. And Bitcoin would survive that. So if one perspective is kind of analytical, theoretical. I don't think that would work because here's why the technology would adapt. The second part, which is even more interesting that I've experienced is actually seeing these things play out. Like what happens if the one and only exchange loses everything two years in? <laughs> you know, that actually happened. And I was like, we probably won't survive this. And then we did. And that taught me something about the robustness. So I, I think that's a great basis for us to like help people go on that skeptic journey because it's a healthy perspective to have. Talk about some of the theoretical attacks, but also talk about some of the experiences we've had that have persuaded us that this isn't just theory, that in practice, we've seen some of these things play out. Yeah. Okay. Well, it seems you brought that one up. Um, maybe for some historical context, um, what, how did you feel when there's this one exchange that was pretty much the only place where, I mean, some people say that it was about 70% of the whole Bitcoin supply was um, being traded on, on Mt. Gox. Um, mm -hmm. And then it turned out that the, you know, the, the whole thing is just shut down with rules and it's all over. Um, can you remember where you were and how you felt when that, when that actually happened? Oh, I, absolutely, I can. So for, first of all, my, my skepticism of uh, MT Gox, as it was called, um, which it was a, a website that was originally bought um, as a Magic the Gathering online exchange and then converted and pivoted to being a Bitcoin exchange uh, and was the only Bitcoin exchange. My journey of skepticism began long before MT Gox failed. Um, MT Gox had had a lot of growing pains. And every time the volume would go up, the lag of trading would shoot through the roof, which would cause a lot of people a lot of tears, right? If you put in an order at a specific price, and then it takes 20 minutes to fill that order, but in the meantime, the price has dropped significantly and you end up losing money, that, that hurts, right? Um, 
So I remember that I had been railing against this site and saying, listen, this isn't safe. Um, do not store your money here. Um, this was the beginning of me beginning to say things like not your keys, not your coins. I had started saying that back then and telling people why they shouldn't leave money on an exchange. But even though I was saying that, there, there's two aspects. There's a lot of people who had money on the exchange who were basically treating it as a vault, as a wallet, not an exchange. But there were also, you know, all of the exchange functions. If you wanted to convert US dollars or any other currency into Bitcoin or back, that was pretty much the only service. This was before any others existed. I remember getting the call. Um, this was before it became public. I got the call from um, some people who were running one of the biggest wallets in the space um, who I was working with at the time. And I was in a diner um, meeting with some family and friends for brunch in San Francisco. And I got the call and I said, excuse me one second, I gotta take this call, it seems urgent. So I took the call and they said, um, we just heard it's probably gonna go public in the next um, hour or so. Um, empty Gox is um, bankrupt the money's all gone and it's going to shut down. And I remember feeling like, oh, that's it. We're done. You know, I mean, I, I, by that point, I put a year and a half of my life into this, um, all of my savings. Um, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in debt. I don't have a job. I haven't yet been paid to do anything in the Bitcoin space. And it was the first time that I actually felt, oh, whew, this could be it. And really because I'd seen that happen before uh, with Liberty Gold. Uh, Liberty Gold, is that what it was called? Liberty, Liberty Dollar and E-Gold and, and a bunch of other more centralized digital currencies before that. So it, it was a sinking feeling. Uh, and I cried that day. I was very upset. I was like, this. I've, I've basically lost everything. Um, I had no money on empty dogs. But I felt this will kill Bitcoin. This could kill Bitcoin. Um, and it didn't. And that changed, that really, really changed my perspective on how robust this system is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do remember what a time it was. And, you know, prior to this, it's, um, it's, easy, it's easy for people to come along now um, and I guess a lot of people think they, they missed the boat, but, uh, you know, Bitcoin shouldn't have succeeded. Um, it was very, very unlikely to succeed. And it was, um, you know, every objection that people had back then were really real objections that were very hard to counter at the time. Um, but yeah, the, everybody losing their money certainly felt like, okay, this, this is the end. Yes, uh, obviously a lot of people who used the exchange as a wallet lost their money. I think it was at the time something like three quarters of a billion dollars um, at a time when that was a very significant percentage of the total um, of the total Bitcoin out there. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is what can we extrapolate from that? Today, a lot of people will say, and I hear this criticism all the time, that if governments wanted to end Bitcoin, all they have to do is shut down the on-ramps and off-ramps, make it very difficult to exchange, and that would kill Bitcoin. And part of my prior experience helps me with this because I, I remember back what happened with MT Gox. And for, for a period of time, not only did we not have any exchanges, but we also lost a significant amount of Bitcoin that ended up being stolen. Um, and, and it didn't, it didn't kill Bitcoin then, um, when a single exchange was enough to shut down all effectively all official channels for converting fiat to, um, Bitcoin and leaving only peer to peer mechanisms, exchanging cash among others. I mean, now, not only would you have to do that in a massive global coordinated effort by world governments, 
because if you leave any of those doors open, everything just flows through there. Um, now we also have stable coins, which, which allow us to, to, to deal with the other aspect, which was problematic then, which is wire transfers of dollars. So we can flow enormous volume through um, these exchanges. And um, even then it wouldn't work. People would revert to P2P. Yeah, it would, it would stop the institutional investors. It would slow down our progress. It would, it would hurt the price temporarily. Um, but if you realize at that moment that this won't actually kill it, you get two results. The first one is any price decline you see, if you know it's not going to kill it, you start thinking, well, I mean, this might be an opportunity. We might be seeing something that is temporary, but doesn't change the long-term valuation, in which case you act on that. Um, but the other thing is you realize that that result and that mentality changes the calculation up front, which is in order for this to work, you'd have to have concerted massive coordination between world governments. But if they knew that in the end, there was a significant possibility that this wouldn't actually kill Bitcoin. And if they knew that trying but failing to kill it ends up backfiring because it feeds the narrative of this thing can survive even concerted action by national governments at a massive scale, well, then they don't even try because that's too dangerous to try. As they say, if you're going to take a shot at the king, make sure you don't miss, right? <laughs> and, and this is exactly the case. Every attempt to kill Bitcoin that fails ends up inadvertently strengthening the narrative that it is, it is not possible to kill this thing. And so therefore, there is this kind of strategic game that play, gets played at a meta level, which is um, it's actually better not to try direct attacks like that, because if they fail, they're, they're worse than not trying at all. Yeah. Well, I remember um, I was in um, Shanghai on a boat at a Bitcoin conference with lots of people um, from the Bitcoin community in this one boat. Um, and the announcement came through that uh, some of the CEOs of the exchanges in China were arrested. Um, and they announced that there was a ban on Bitcoin exchanges in China. Um, and suddenly we were um, on, this, on this boat with lots of people that were at the conference. Um, and we heard like this, these sirens happening. And we thought that, uh, that everyone was coming, you know, that this boat was going to be pulled aside and we're all going to disappear in a prison in China. Um, but then the boat just went straight past and everything carries. But the price corrected um, and it had, a, it, you know, a couple of thousand um, points that came off the price at that stage. Um, but then that went into a, a raging bull market. Um, and, uh, you know, we had this, these industries. And what I've, what I've seen is that every time, firstly, you talked about it has to be coordinated because when one country does it, we've seen what happens. Um, and the two things, the, the two trends that I saw as a result of that were firstly, um, all, of the, all of the volume went to Japan, South Korea, and Singapore. Um, and Japan, who were the host of the exchange we talked about earlier, Mt. Gox, and another big one that got hacked, CoinCheck, had been working a lot on their regulations of crypto exchanges. Um, and so China, they, they allowed the mining industry to continue, but they banned the exchanges. Now, the interesting thing about that is if I were a government and I was trying to collect lots of data, um, you know, mining is you put some fiat money and you buy some machines and Bitcoins come out and they can go anywhere. Um, but with exchanges, you've got to do all the, you know your customer and you've got to collect all the data. Um, so what happened is all of the data went to South Korea, ex South Korean exchanges, Japanese exchanges and Singapore exchanges. Um, and uh, China lost the data collection that they might have wanted. Um, as we know, it's a big agenda of governments to collect all that data. Um, the second thing that happened, so it just goes to another country. So then you have to have the coordinated effort. Um, but the second thing is you start to get the real innovation coming through. And that was when, it was after that, 
the, the, this phrase DEX came around, decentralized exchange, um, because everyone starts figuring out, well, how do you do this in the peer-to-peer? -peer? You know, everyone was doing this peer-to-peer -peer trade. You had to go exchange cash. Um, but then people started through technology, started figuring out how can we do that online? Um, and the innovation just gets further and further and further. So if you start to see right now, the big, you know, the big thing is uh, uh, DeFi. Um, if there is a regulatory crackdown, which I'm sure there will be, um, then people start to push the innovation further. And then other countries see the opportunities and start putting robust regulations for the centralized. So for me, it, it drives the centralized business somewhere else and it drives the decentralized innovation as a result. And it just continues. Yeah, I, to, to me, I think what we have to think about is that when you have a decentralized system like this, that, that is truly global, um, there, there is an asymmetry of action. In order for centralized institutions, regulators, governments, et cetera, to crack down or um, put a halt or slow down this system, they have to coordinate. Um, and their coordination has to be near perfect. Um, I, I use another example about decentralization, the asymmetry of centralized versus decentralized systems, which is this. Imagine your favorite um, super band is having a concert at a stadium. And it's a wonderful concert. Everyone wants to be there. The ticket is $1,000. And the stadium has 100 gates where you can enter. And um, 99 of those gates have uh, a ticket checking um, station uh, and check for tickets. And one of those gates is wide open and anyone can walk in. Simon, what is the ticket price for that concert? Um, free. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> it's free because if you have one gate that's free, everybody goes through that gate. I mean, there still might be some people who go through the other gates because they've already paid for the tickets, maybe for convenience because it's closer to the parking lot. But just like when you have these outdoor um, concerts and someone knocks one of the fences down and then you see a whole group of band fans going, ah, running through the fences and <laughs> through the fields being chased by one or two elderly security guards in yellow vests, completely failing to stop the crowd. This is the asymmetry of decentralized versus decentralized. In order to control a system like that that operates on a decentralized basis, you have to 100% block all the exits. Otherwise, if you let one exit and the switching costs between gates are zero, um, the bottom line is that you failed. So a 1% failure in control is entirely equivalent to 100% failure in control. So you've got centralized systems and centralized governments that have to coordinate perfectly with no one stepping out of the game. Um, and then you have a decentralized system that is reacting to these decisions. And the decentralized system doesn't have to succeed everywhere. It only has to succeed in one place because this is virtual, because there's no switching costs. You just redirect all of the flows through that one place. And you may lose some volume at first, but, but very quickly, you're then going to focus the innovation on optimizing that path. And there's a very big monetary reward for those who optimize it. Um, it's a bit like trying to build a dam and, um, you know, you've got the world's best engineers and I'm one dude with a little drill. Um, you know, it's a great dam you got there, but I've got a hammer drill. So let's see who, who, who wins. Um, I don't need to make the whole dam fall down. I only need to make a hole this big. That's it. Um, the water will do the rest. The water will take that tiny hole and it will optimize its egress by making it wider and wider and wider until the dam is gone. So money works that way. If you have a hole this big in the international system of financial controls and surveillance, which is exactly what Bitcoin is, it's the pinprick, the small trickle that gets through 
actually funds the development of the, and the innovation and the technology and the standing up of infrastructure to widen that hole. Um, if you've got a, a country like Venezuela that has currency controls and where the premium for Bitcoin is 30% above price, then whoever's able to send a trickle of Bitcoin into Venezuela and exchange it earns a 30% premium to use to expand their operations as fast as they can. <laughs> and, and so that just makes the hole bigger. And, and this keeps repeating at every level. So decentralized versus centralized systems. The centralizers have to get everything right. The decentralized system only has to make a pinprick. That pinprick will actually self-fund its widening and the innovation. And the end result will be that you just break through the dam completely. And this has happened again and again and again and again with Bitcoin. Yeah. So I guess um, let's look at the coordinated effort scenario. So I can imagine a world, especially where we are today, where um, IMF calls out for Bretton Woods 2, already done. Um, they sit down in a meeting and it turns out that the whole world um, has completely ruined their uh, fiscal and monetary policy, done. Um, and uh, they have to all sit around in a room and they all coordinate a Facebook style Libra monetary system using central bank digital currencies. Uh, and they decide on a global scale that they're all going to coordinate um, and implement some new global monetary system that's backed by a basket of all these different uh, currencies. And then simultaneously, they all agree that in order to opt into this system, they all need to make Bitcoin illegal for uh, the use and purchase in their country. I think the you know the only the only example we've ever got of something like that was you know when the United States tried to make gold illegal so they could prevent hoarding, um, but we've never seen it on a global uh, coordinated scale. Um, so while that is one of the risks that could happen, do you think? Bitcoin could survive such a coordinated um, centralized monetary system and, uh, and do you reckon it would survive that? It would absolutely survive. It would stop thriving temporarily. And the reason for that is because right now, a lot of the volume in Bitcoin is driven by those who can use other monetary systems, have access to the global economy, um, and choose to voluntarily use Bitcoin as a hedge, as a speculative instrument, as a plaything, as a way to invest in some future protocol. And a lot of those people would obviously be discouraged by such regulation. It, it all comes down to where you think the primary economic value of the world economy lies. Does it lie? in the spreadsheets, the fiat denominated spreadsheets of investors and speculators operating in the markets. Are the markets the economy? The regulated equity global markets, the currency markets, are, is that the world economy? Or is the world economy a million papaya and banana stands on the side of the road or taco trucks? Is the world economy the productive output of seven and a half billion humans trying to improve their own lot? I certainly believe it's the latter, which, which then means that what exactly does that seven and a half billion mass of humanity have to lose um, if, the, if the, the issue here is I can either make a living and follow the law or I can either make a living or follow the law. I either follow the law and starve or break the law and survive. Well, we know exactly how that equation works out because uh, we see it today in the global patterns of adoption of Bitcoin, in the adoption across the global South where it is being used as a tool of survival. And for that population, if you, if you had this kind of global coordination, that would fail. So 
that's one aspect. But the other aspect is this. Great, so the IMF comes out and does this, and they do this whole global coordination thing, and um, they try to shut down Bitcoin. Well, here's the thing. This is a bit like OPEC. Uh, this is a bit like a cartel activity. And cartel activities work best when the market is very small, um, when the number of parties that have to coordinate is very small, and when the upside is very high, right? So, um, but what we're talking about here is coordinating between a hundred different governments around the world in a very international system on something like money that is broadly used. Now, to me, that's impossible because any country that breaks ranks with the cartel gains enormously through arbitrage. By saying, you know, that's cute what you're trying to do, but we think that if we actually go our own way and we enable on ramps and off ramps into an ounce of Bitcoin, in the first round, we're going to get a lot of the people who are abandoning Bitcoin to come to us. And in the second round, we're going to actually be able to grow substantially by being outside the system because we're outside the system already. China would do that, in my opinion, almost immediately. They're, they have no strategic advantage to signing on to a, to a global system that is already dominated by the US and used for sanctions and geopolitical control and hand them a new system that's that minus any alternatives, competition, exits, or safety valves. That's strategic suicide. Um, and of course, for the very same reasons, Russia wouldn't sign on to this. And then what you end up doing is you have exactly the kind of split um, that we saw during the Cold War. You end up with a currency Cold War. And then you have a situation where there are basically two spheres of influence. There's the first world. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the term third world simply meant the unaligned nations. First world was the Western countries on the Cold War. Second world was the Eastern countries that were involved in the Cold War. And third world was just anyone who wasn't either with the Soviets or with the Americans. Um, it was about splitting the world into two spheres of influence. So if you end up doing that with currencies again, where you have the post Bretton Woods international money, money system dominated by Western nations, and then you have the outsider saying no, dominated by China and Russia, um, which would end up taking most of Africa with them, good chunk of South America, all of Southeast Asia, um, you then end up with two completely different spheres of the economy. Now, let's think about this. They would not be allowed to talk to each other, right? Um, because they're both closed systems. So there'd be only one way to move value from one to the other, which would be a permissionless system. In that case, Bitcoin actually becomes the rails for connecting the two spheres. So if you want to move money from you know, the Sino-Soviet region of money to the Anglo region of money, the only rail that connects the two um, is Bitcoin. I mean, that, in my opinion, not only fails spectacularly, but then it actually elevates Bitcoin to world reserve currency um, mm -hmm. very, very quickly. Yeah. Through neutrality. Neutrality becomes its leading um, factor. Both sides see that if I have to choose between a system that is controlled by this set of countries that are not allied with me or that set of countries that are not allied with me. How about I just choose a system that's not controlled by any country so it doesn't matter if they're allied with me or not. Neutrality then becomes the winner by default. Yeah. So Bitcoin becomes a tool for geopolitical currency wars. Um, yes. And, and uh, you know, the thing is, if you create a system whereby the dominant function of currency is sanctions, then sanctions evasion is no longer a game of one or two countries. Then sanctions evasion is, is a game of half the planet against the other half of the planet, right? Um, at which point the sanctions evading 
currency uh, becomes geopolitically important. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move to an, another common objection. Um, uh, let's look at mining. Um, so firstly, let's not assume everyone knows um, like what, what mining is. So, um, you know, Bitcoin is backed by uh, proof of work. Um, and we're about to get a large scale experiment of uh, one of the significant cryptocurrencies, Ethereum, switching from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, so we actually get to see two cryptocurrencies that have adoption for their own use cases. And we get to actually see in real time, um, you know, the, the infinite expectations of what happens with proof of work and proof of stake, assuming these two systems survive. Um, but one of the big objections is the whole inefficiency of proof of work um, and how bad it is for the environment um, and how if Bitcoin becomes as significant as it could be, it will consume so much electricity um, that it becomes this just completely clunky, inefficient network. Um, what would you say about uh, the proof of work and actually maybe just start with helping people understand the difference between proof of work, proof of stake and where you think these go? Yeah, proof of work is about um, connecting currency to the ultimate form of value, which is energy. Everything we do on this planet is um, underwritten by energy. Uh, the food we eat is, is solar energy captured by photosynthesizing organisms and then converted off a food chain into other forms of food. Um, the heating in our homes, the um, ability to transport things around the planet, everything is energy. So um, in most currencies, the use of energy um, is mediated between the currency and the underlying energy by institutions that um, essentially change the exchange rate between energy and currency. So if you think about it, um, we just have a bigger chain for energy consumption. The US dollar is backed by energy, but instead of being backed directly by energy through proof of work, which is an efficient way of backing it by energy, you do it indirectly by energy. So you burn uh, you know, 100 million barrels of oil in order to wage war on lots of countries to control their oil reserves. Um, you have um, all of these secondary effects, all of which ultimately consume a lot of energy, in fact, in much more polluting ways, to do non-productive um, functions that act as a backing of the currency. Um, and... You know, if you call Bitcoin proof of work, I would call the US dollar proof of war. Um, and that is the most polluting form of energy and the um, least beneficial form of energy use we have on the planet. The military is the worst polluter in the country uh, and by extension in the world. Um, so the idea that Bitcoin is inefficient um, misses the point, which is that proof of work is a mechanism for providing security in order to make the currency work that does not have all of the intermediate forms of energy consumption in between the energy and the providing security. Um, and so it's a much more direct way of providing security for the currency. And unlike um, traditional currencies where you don't get to choose where the energy will be consumed or how it will be produced, uh, Bitcoin actually gravitates to places where energy is overproduced and underconsumed, where you have remote production systems that are not connected to distribution grids, where you have developing nations that are moving fast and building new capacity without being able to distribute it, where you have newly launched uh, alternative energy systems, wind, solar, hydro, et cetera, um, that again have overcapacity in production and uh, are not yet, um, do not yet have sufficient demand. And in all of those places, uh, Bitcoin gravitates and provides um, 
a subsidy that reduces the unit cost of electricity production for those systems of energy. So essentially, it's a subsidy system for solar, wind, hydro, and alternative energy in places where um, that development is needed the most. Um, and, and we've seen that in practice. This is not just a speculative thing. We've seen that that's exactly how um, Bitcoin mining gravitates towards those sources of energy. Um, now, proof of work is one mechanism of doing it. Proof of stake is a different mechanism of doing it. And they have different pros and cons. They're not, um, they're not exactly uh, substitute uh, mechanisms. They're not equivalent. What you can do with proof of work is not the same as what you can do with proof of stake. Proof of work actually provides you with historical immutability, the ability to cement the past um, in a way that it cannot be changed, um, which is incredibly important for a very robust uh, currency. A proof of work also gives you something else, which is that it allows you to bootstrap a currency without a prior distribution mechanism. You see, the thing is with proof of stake, um, and let me explain proof of stake briefly. Proof of stake is where instead of using energy to back the currency, you use the currency um, by putting down a bond um, that you will do the security verification for every new transaction that happens. And if you fulfill your promise and do the security correctly, you get a slight reward. You earn some interest, essentially. Uh, it's a bit like using a certificate of deposit or... Uh, investing in a bond and, and, and generating some yield as you maintain the security of the system through audits, right? So you're putting down an auditor bond, you're then auditing the system, and if you audit it successfully according to everybody else's uh, expectation, then you earn a bit of reward. If you audit it incorrectly, then you lose some of your principal. Here's the thing. In order to do proof of stake, you need to have the, the currency that is going to be used to stake already distributed. And of course, in order to, to do proof of stake fairly, where you, you don't have one person or group of people seize control from the very beginning, you have to have a, a fairly broad distribution of the currency before you start proof of stake. Well, that creates a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You can't bootstrap a proof of stake system um, ab initio. You can't do it. You can't have a virgin birth of a proof of stake system because essentially all of the control is in one group, um, which is why many proof of stake systems actually bootstrap as proof of work. Proof of work allows you to do a virgin birth like we had with, with, with Bitcoin. You bootstrap it. Um, the proof of work is used as a mechanism to distribute the currency um, based on competition of resources. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Once you've done that, you can actually switch to proof of stake if you want to. Um, ironically, the efforts to perfect proof of stake, to improve, to um, test at bigger and bigger scale, to put under adversarial trial um, proof of stake systems in Ethereum, is actually an enormous safety mechanism for Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's proof of work and immutability is an enormous safety mechanism for proof of stake systems. Allow me to explain. One of the difficulties a proof of stake system has is that it cannot safeguard the immutability of the past. Um, there's a type of attack against proof of stake systems called a long range attack, where essentially what you can do is you can rewrite the past um, beyond a certain depth for zero cost. Because there's no way to prove that that past is immutable. Um, in a proof of work system, if you've used the energy and then you try to recalculate the past, you have to re-expend the same amount of energy. There's no shortcut. You can't do it without proving the proof of work. So if you spent gigawatts to get to today and you wanted to rewrite the past, you'd have to spend those gigawatts again to rewrite it. Um, and that preserves the past very robustly because of course you only get rewarded once, um, but you expend the energy twice if you try to rewrite the past. In proof of stake, you can't do that, but you could take proof of stake checkpoints and embed them in a proof of work 
blockchain that gives you the robust protection of the past and therefore safeguards your proof of stake blockchain from long range attacks. You can use the proof of work blockchain as an oracle that gives you checkpointing. In fact, a number of chains already do that with Bitcoin. But here's the other way it works. The key scenario that most people are worried about is the miners get shut down. Somehow, um, a government coerces all of the miners into shutting down their operations or seizes their operations or takes over and forces them to censor transactions or whatever. And we find ourselves in a situation where we cannot guarantee that 51% of the mining is in honest hands, which is the prerequisite for maintaining a proof of work chain. Well, there are a number of things that can be done um, at that point. Um, there can be proof of authority overlays where you basically say, um, these miners have acted improperly in the past. We're not going to accept them. We're going to vet some of the miners and sign their blocks and only accept those. Tricky to do. Um, but here's a thought of how we could actually fix this in Bitcoin, which would be to switch to proof of stake, perhaps temporarily, perhaps long term. You take out all the miners, we switch to proof of stake. Um, the funny thing is that Bitcoin's already been distributed. So you've, we've already solved the virgin birth problem. We already have Bitcoin holders who have in their best interest to maintain the honesty of the chain, uh, which means that those people staking their Bitcoin would actually protect the system against proof of work attacks. The thing is, you don't need to implement that solution for it to be an effective countermeasure. Simply the fact that you can means that an attack against miners is ultimately um, a failed attack. It involves spending hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of dollars in uh, infrastructure build out if you're going to do a 51% attack, or it involves expending enormous political and strategic capital to uh, compromise and coerce the miners in your state. And then ultimately what that results is in someone nuking your, um, your strategic Bitcoin infrastructure from under your feet um, and kicking you off the position of power that you had and now just lost. To achieve what exactly? Nothing. So <laughs> the mere existence of a countermeasure Acts, um, acts to prevent this attack. Uh, this is a bit like uh, Chekhov's gun. Um, you know, when they say, if you see uh, um, a gun on the mantelpiece in act one of a play, someone's going to get shot in act three. Um, the presence of that thing signals what comes next. The fact that we have more than one effective consensus algorithm now um, prevents an attack against um, consensus algorithms. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so I guess so. summarizing that, the mining centralization argument is a big thing. Um, people always are concerned. Um, you know, originally you could fire up a laptop and you could use your computer power to mine Bitcoin. Then it moved to more uh, complex graphic cards and then it moved to specific machines and now it's institutionalized and people you know of well firstly um, when people say that about 65 percent of mining happens in china um is that something that actually is true and can be verified um and do you see a scenario where um you know the chinese government nationalizes all that mining power um and bitcoin becomes china coin um, so first of all, there's no way to actually verify that. Uh, people make uh, a, a gross simplification in most of these arguments where what they say is 70% of the mining pools are concentrated in China, and then they uh, equate mining pools with mining power, and that's absolutely not the case. Um, mining pools are consortia um, of mining power that concentrates the activity of mining, but they don't physically exist anywhere. So you can participate with your mining power in any mining pool you want. And most importantly, the switching costs 
moving from one mining pool to another are zero. So if someone takes over a mining pool and you don't like how they're operating, you just switch mining pools and that's it. And the mining power drains enormously fast. We've seen this happen several times in Bitcoin's past, where a mining pool has acted suspiciously, or even a rumor has been started that a mining pool might act suspiciously, and the mining power in that pool evaporates overnight, like 95% drop in power overnight. So we know that 70% of the hash rate that presents through mining pools is through mining pools that we see are located in China because we can identify the location of mining pools. But we don't know where the actual mining power is. Um, uh, there's good reason to believe that a chunk of it is in, in China, probably more than 50%, possibly as big as 70%, but we don't know that. Um, that's also not to say that you, you don't have pools of mining power that exist in other countries or that you might not have pools of mining power that could be brought up rather quickly in other countries. Um, the long-term trend has been one of decentralization of mining power. So if you think about it from a numbers perspective, in 2009, there was one miner who had 100% of the hash power, Satoshi. And that was the most centralized mining we've ever had, but it didn't matter because um, the rule here is that more than 51% must be in honest hands. It doesn't matter in, in this case, one set of hands, but as long as that was honest, it worked. And then it was two, and then it was three. And now we have you know, thousands of miners with machines all around the world some estimates um, in terms of the actual machines um, is that we're looking at you know, more than 2 million pieces of hardware, devices that are mining. Um, and so from that perspective, it's decentralized. Uh, even within China, I mean, China is an enormous country uh, with a lot of very remote rural areas where various kinds of deals with local officials generating enormous revenue through the back door are enabled through these mining functions. Even if the Chinese government decided, let's take down all the miners, um, you know, this is the conversation I imagine. Um, hello, central party? Yes. Uh, we should do what? shut down all the miners in our province. Oh, we don't have any miners in our province. Oh, you found some. We will shut them down immediately. Guys, shut it down for an hour. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the problem here is that, yes, okay, China has very, very strong controls that they can expand, expand and extend very strongly all across the country, but, we're talking about money here. And in a centralized system like that, where the rule of law is weak, money has an incredible corrupting influence. <laughs> the amount of bribes that can be marshaled off a Bitcoin mine to every layer of official within that area. So yes, it's possible to shut them all down, but China would have to want to do that in a very draconian fashion, which of course they might decide to do. But you have to ask why would they do that? What do they gain exactly? Um, and the truth is that right now it serves them better to keep um, that in their back pocket um, than basically push the entire industry uh, to the United States and other Western nations um, with no hope of seeing it return to their shores ever again um, for no reason. Uh, it doesn't really give them any advantage. The final thing is to understand that taking control of the miners doesn't allow you to break the rules. If you have control of all of the mining, you still can't spend Bitcoin that isn't yours. You still can't take all of the Bitcoin. You still can't um, make transactions pay different people. You can stop the network. That's it. Um, and so in order to do this kind of attack, you have to have one and only one goal, and that is to stop the network. And, and, and then it goes into the idea of if you do that and you fail to stop the network, what have you proven? You've proven that it's not stoppable. So there's a very, very big risk and failure there, again, as in many attack vectors on Bitcoin. That doesn't mean that China is not going to do this. They might. 
Um, and, and this might end up um, wounding Bitcoin severely and setting it back by years. Um, but I am, not, uh, I am not of the mind that the development community and the rest of the ecosystem in uh, Bitcoin will simply sit back, let that happen, take no countermeasures whatsoever and not come back with a torrent of innovation. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. I think that triggers a defense response, which leads me to my final thought on this kind of category of problems, which is we have to think about this in terms of evolution. This is not a, a, a single um, system battling another single system. This is um, millions of uh, independent agents uh, in various governments, regulators, um, and countries battling millions of individuals with their systems that are dispersed around the world, uh, software programmers, miners, users, wallets, exchange operators who, are, who have their own interests, right? So if you think about these as two giant populations and you think about them engaging in some kind of battle, um, then if, if the predators in that environment create a new attack that finds a vulnerability in the prey, um, what we know from nature is that that creates an evolutionary response. Um, and what happens when you attack a prey animal is depends. Um, take a look at Australia. Uh, you can see there what happens when you have um, a lot of animals in a very harsh and hostile environment. Uh, they become scaly, armored, venomous, and poisonous um, things. So that eventually there are very few cuddly um, critters in the country and almost everything can kill you. Um, my theory is this, right now, Bitcoin is a gecko. If you start stomping on all the little geckos, you trigger an evolutionary response and the gecko starts getting bigger, sturdier, scalier, poisonous, angry, and reactive. And what you end up is you drive evolution from a gecko to a Komodo dragon. And if you try to step on a Komodo dragon, it will bite your foot off. Um, so if the governments of the world decide to try an attack like that on Bitcoin, they will drive an evolutionary response at the protocol level, at the user interface level, that will make the system stealthy, reactive, uh, evasive, and vicious in response. And um, that will actually end up making it unstoppable. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, uh, let's do that topic. Um, next one is uh, quantum computing. Mm -hmm. um, can a quantum computer take down Bitcoin? And is that, is that on the horizon? Um, a quantum computer can um, take money from an elliptic curve digital signature um, signed transaction or an address. Um, by reversing a public key into a private key. That is not the same as taking down Bitcoin, however. Uh, and that's due to a number of innovations that exist in Bitcoin. So first of all, um, elliptic curve cryptography that is used in Bitcoin is susceptible to quantum analysis, um, cryptanalysis, meaning that if you have an elliptic curve public key, um, you can't get the private key because that's um, the mathematical equivalent of doing division in the elliptic curve domain, which is not possible. Uh, you would have to try every possible private key in order to find the one that gives you that public key, also known as a brute force attack. In the classical computing environment, therefore, you can't take a public key and find the corresponding private key or take a digital signature and find the corresponding private key. With a quantum computer, however, you can, as long as you have a quantum computer that can actually do calculations at 256 qubits. Actually, I think it's only 128 because of the nature of quantum um, cryptanalysis, but you need a lot of qubits. Um, we're nowhere near getting that many qubits, but 
Let's say theoretically you did have a computer like that. Well, you could go on the Bitcoin blockchain and you could find any transaction that has a digital signature or a public key in it, and you could find the corresponding private key. Now, here's the interesting thing. Digital signatures and public keys don't appear in Bitcoin until you spend. When you receive Bitcoin, you receive it to an address, which is a double hash. Um, and the public key and digital signature isn't shown until you spend. So if you're not reusing Bitcoin addresses, if every time you do a transaction, you use a new address, and if any time you sign for an address, you spend everything that's in that address and send the change to a new address, when I've shown you my public key and my signature, it's to a private key that no longer controls money because the reason you saw it is because I just spent it all from there. Um, which, which actually really narrows the focus of such an attack. You'd only be able to do it against keys that have been reused. Um, quantum computing would also not be very effective for breaking SHA-256. So, that's a whole different domain of problems is doing a, a pre-image attack on a hash algorithm. Um, there's no indication that you can really accelerate that with a quantum computer. There are no, as far as I know, good algorithms that can do that. So money in reused keys would be vulnerable, but um, at the same time, that's not the end of Bitcoin because we can change the signature algorithm. So we can change to a quantum resistant signature algorithm, and then it's resistant to quantum computers. In fact, if quantum computing is widespread, if I can have it in my ThinkPad, um, then I can use a quantum digital signature that cannot be broken by a quantum computer. If I can sign with a quantum computer, then you can't break it with a quantum computer. So we just upgrade everything to quantum capable systems. Um, the, the bottom line is that if you think of Bitcoin as a completely static system where everybody publishes all of their digital signatures, yes, that's vulnerable to quantum computer, but that's not what Bitcoin is. It's a system where we don't publish our signatures until we empty an address uh, for the most part. And then it's also a system that can evolve where we can change the signature algorithm. In fact, the very next upgrade in Bitcoin that is being planned right now um, it's called Taproot. It's a collection of changes that is being planned for 2021 introduction into the Bitcoin code base, includes a new signature algorithm called Schnorr signatures. The, the fact that we can go from elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, ECDSA, to Schnorr signatures and have both of those systems work in parallel um, simply demonstrate the fact that we could also have another and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth signature algorithm, all coexisting. Um, and we can evolve them over time. So as long as the system continues to evolve, um, and as long as quantum computers are not capable of doing the amount of qubits that are needed to break our key lengths, um, we are not only safe, but we can stay ahead of this game. Okay, and then just help help us understand that if if someone had such a quantum computer, what what other things in the world except for Bitcoin would be affected by that? Are that would this affect like the security of our bank accounts, or is it just something that would affect Bitcoin? Every system of encryption on the planet is immediately vulnerable, which means. Um, all of the uh, web security certificates, SSL, all of the bank-to-bank -bank communications, all of the embassy communications, all of the communications with the nuclear submarines, all of the communications with aircraft, all of the communications at every level, all of encryption breaks um, if you have a quantum computer, which interestingly enough then makes this the most important secret in the world and um, it's the one that you keep dry until you need it. So let's say, for example, that the NSA created a quantum computer with enough qubit capacity to break um, other governments' communication secrets. Well, at that point, you don't want to use it. And if you do use it, you want to have the ability to do what's called parallel construction, meaning that you need to have a cover story. So if someone says, hang on a second, 
it appears they know that we were going to be in the red square at noon exchanging this diplomatic envelope. Did they break our communications? No, probably not. They actually got it by beating up Yuri last week. Um, you need an other story that's more plausible than they have a quantum computer that can read all of our messages. Yeah. We actually have a historical parallel to this. In, uh, in I think it was 1941, between 1941 and 1944, um, the Allies broke Enigma, the G German, the Axis um, encryption uh, computer machine uh, that was being used by Germans to control submarine fleets, to communicate about air raids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They broke this in England at a place called Bletchley Park under the um, leadership of Alan Turing, the father of computer science. And this then became the most important secret in the war because they could now read the German communications, not immediately, not all of them, um, but enough and fast enough that they could actually take action. So they had to then construct a complete intelligence system that ensured that for every lead that they followed, they had a cover story that gave a better explanation than Enigma is broken so that the Germans wouldn't stop using the Enigma machine. Um, and in fact, there's a specific example in the war when the Allies found out that Coventry was about to be bombed with one of the biggest raids in the war. And they had the choice between preventing possibly tens of thousands of deaths in the city of Coventry and revealing, and they didn't have a good cover story. And so they decided to let the Germans bomb Coventry and not warn anyone. So Bitcoin is the attack that doesn't have a good cover story. You start seeing coins from years ago moving that nobody thinks anyone can break the keys. The, the, the idea starts growing in your mind that maybe someone out there has a quantum computer capable of breaking ECDSA, which um, then um, creates a worldwide scramble to migrate away from quantum vulnerable encryption systems, and it completely defangs that very important um, intelligence tool. So um, if someone has such a tool or is able to build such a tool more likely over the next 15 years, um, they would be very smart not to use it on Bitcoin um, and instead to keep it and hold it and pretend that such a thing doesn't exist um, and use it only under dire circumstances. Okay. What about um, developer centralization? So over the years, we've seen um, politics within the Bitcoin space with significant developers that have more influence um, maybe they own, you know, the, well, it's, it's open source, but someone controls the, the GitHub passwords. Um, and uh, we've seen claims that uh, um, certain developers from within an organization like Blockstream, um, when they have more influence over the Bitcoin code, um, that you could have a corporate takeover. Um, how, how, you know, how do we protect and what's the risk of, a, a, a few key developers like making some malicious attacks or being compromised or being ransomed in order to do something? Well, the, the, the first and biggest defense is that um, this system is an open source system, which means that anyone can and thousands of people do inspect all of the code changes that go into Bitcoin. Um, I read GitHub logs. I follow... Um, not all, but many of the conversations that are happening um, on the developer mailing lists, in the developer IRC, in the, and in the GitHub pull requests, which are the requests for changes that are happening and publicly discussed. And you can read the code and see what exactly is being changed, how and why. There is a very, very small possibility that someone could sneak um, a code change in there that has an unintended or side effect that is not immediately obvious. But again, this is a decentralized system. So you change the code of Bitcoin Core. Does that change the security of wallets that don't depend on Bitcoin Core? Nope. Um, so there is no central piece of code that is used everywhere in Bitcoin other than the mining functions 
the core consensus algorithms, which are very, very, very carefully scrutinized. And of course, um, even there, uh, people don't only run one code base. They run a couple of different code bases. They're very slow to upgrade and they take their time to make sure there's no problems because not because they're expecting back doors, but because they expect bugs that inevitably happen. And you know, if you lose money because of a bug, it doesn't hurt or sting any less than losing it or any more than losing it because of a back door, right? <laughs> you lose money either way. So um, open source code creates an environment in which it is very difficult to introduce changes. Um, the, ecosystem around Bitcoin uses a variety of code bases at different levels within the um, application stack. And they're written independently in different languages by different people. And they're all scrutinizing the main role, uh, rules that run in consensus and interacting with them and running a barrage of programming tests on those rules um, to know if something has changed that's going to affect their software. So, can a programmer introduce a backdoor? Not really. Um, and it would, the, they'd have to introduce it in a way that goes unnoticed and spreads widely and then gets adopted by multiple stacks and then can be executed in such a way as to cause widespread damage that can't be fixed by patching or, or even rolling back the chain. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of ifs. Um, and so if you think about it from a probability perspective, the probability of the first thing happening is 10%. The probability of the second thing happening is 10%. So 10% times 10%, 1%. The probability of the third thing happening. So you have an exponential decay of probability with every step that you add to this chain. This is why conspiracy theories don't work. <laughs> it's because the probabilities multiply in a way that um, exponentially decreases the chance of it succeeding. Um, so no, you can't do that. Um, on the other hand, um, can you create an environment in which development is hijacked in such a way that others can't develop alternative paths um, or follow alternative attempts to develop the code um, or disagree with big decisions. Um, I think that was answered conclusively in August of 2017. And the answer is that other development teams can build their own and can fork off from Bitcoin and then can solicit the businesses, the owners, the wallets, the exchanges, etc., to follow their version. Um, now, you're going to hear a lot of people say, but censorship and bullying prevented us from succeeding. And I don't believe that because when Bitcoin started, nobody believed in it. It was absolutely censored everywhere. Um, there was plenty of bullying from mainstream financial circles. And yet Bitcoin did succeed because it could succeed on the merits. And I would argue that alternative teams that have tried to implement changes to the Bitcoin code have failed on the merits because they have failed to maintain it, to develop features that people actually want, to follow the conservative ethos that, is, that the market is demonstrating through its choices, whether you agree with it or not, and have failed to appeal to the businesses and the users in the ecosystem to follow them. But if it was in fact the case that the developers tried to pull a coup where they tried to push changes or prevent changes that were broadly desired, um, they would fail. And they would fail because um, they would fail on the merits. Other people could very easily bootstrap that code, um, run it independently with the changes that they want, and maintain it by attracting the best talent in the space. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about all of the conspiracies of why that hasn't happened for some of the forks of Bitcoin, but the bottom line is that that represents a supreme lack of faith in the ability of the market to discern um, the merit of different solutions. Um, and I trust, um, I trust the, the market. I mean, bottom line, there's no amount of censorship that can make 
a solution that is inferior or peer superior, not over the long term. Okay, we're going to do one more and then I'm going to leave with one question. Um, so the Satoshi, um, the million Bitcoin, moving some of those coins, what's the likelihood of that? I mean, it's possible at some point that that happens. Um, I think it's extremely unlikely. Honestly, we don't know who Satoshi is, uh, if he, she, or they. Um, we, we don't know if they're still alive, quite honestly. Um, and we certainly don't know if they still have control and access to the keys in order to use them. Um, this is unknown. And, and unknown doesn't mean I think they're not alive or I think they don't have control. It's, it really does mean unknown. They might, they might not. There is zero possibility of going one way or another um, because we don't have the information to make that determination. So from that perspective, um, there is a possibility, um, but that possibility gets slimmer with time, meaning that Satoshi Nakamoto has disappeared since 2010, um, and none of the Bitcoin has ever moved. Um, Ten years later, that fact not only hasn't changed, but it's had 10 years piled on top of it. Um, and so if you follow kind of the general logic here, uh, every year that passes cements the probability that they're not going to move. If they did move, that would be a shock to the system, for sure. It would be a shock to the system because it would, it would demonstrate one of two possibilities. One, um, that Satoshi Nakamoto's keys have been accessed and someone controls them and is able to move, either Satoshi themselves or somebody who managed to get access to those keys, inherit access to those keys, find those keys, whatever. Um, the second possibility, ironically, goes back to the previous conversation we had, which is that a quantum computer has cracked those keys. Um, especially with some of the early keys, um, they are paid to public keys. So the public key is visible and the money's sitting in them. Um, so therefore, a quantum computer, its first target, uh, its juiciest target, its easiest to attack target is the Satoshi stash. Um, so how do we know if a quantum computer exists that can break ACDSA? Simple, Satoshi's coins start moving. Um, in, in fact, at some point after a decade or so, it might actually be the more likely explanation. So you see the coins moving, you're like, did Satoshi come back from the dead? Or did a quantum computer uh, emerge that can break these? Um, I start leaning as the years go by, I start leaning more towards, okay, it appears a quantum computer has emerged that can do this. But I think we're still a decade away from that. Um, it would cause a massive amount of volatility in the space by injecting an enormous amount of liquidity on the supply side of Bitcoin. But it would also once and for all resolve the question. Um, and so, um, you know, you probably know, I think this is characteristic of markets which is, um, you know, uh, what's the what's the thing? Um, sell the rumor, buy the fact, or right? Um, the fact that there's uncertainty um, can cause a lot of volatility. If something starts happening that is unexpected, the markets react badly. But as soon as that becomes expected, you get the opposite reaction. The markets go, oh, well, I guess Satoshi's coins moved. Bitcoin didn't die completely. Its price dipped. Well, now Bitcoin, at whatever price it's priced in now, is a Bitcoin in which Satoshi's coins have moved and are therefore part of the supply and priced in. Therefore, its future is now certain. That is no longer hanging over it, um, which usually traders react to very optimistically at that point, because you remove that chunk of uncertainty. Um, so sometimes having the bad news confirmed leads to a rally in the markets, because you went from uncertainty to confirmation, even though what's been confirmed is bad news. Okay, so I think this is a, a nice place to conclude it up. I think 
it seems like the biggest risk to Bitcoin is that um, Bitcoin becomes so statistically um, and geopolitically significant in the world um, that a coordinated effort by all the governments all around the world um, uh, and the IMF and the World Bank and the Bank of International Settlements all get together um, and they create their central bank world global digital currency and simultaneously invent a quantum computer um, and attack the Satoshi keys. Um, and that seems like the, the, the risk that Bitcoin fails. If that's not it, what in your consideration is the biggest risk to Bitcoin? The biggest risk to Bitcoin, in my opinion, is a fragmentation within the community and a dilution of the fundamental principles. Um, the biggest risk in Bitcoin is that people who um, are in Bitcoin already forget why we got into it and get seduced by the possibility of riches to sell out all of the principles that make Bitcoin special and basically hand the baton to something that replaces Bitcoin because it actually achieves the principles that Bitcoin espouses more effectively. We give up on um, privacy, fungibility, censorship resistance, neutrality, borderless operation, open access, um, limited monetary supply. Um, we start giving up on those principles one by one, um, compromising um, and turning Bitcoin into more and more and more of a uh, kind of Disney version of Bitcoin, right? Um, we, we polish the rough edges, we take off the, the sharp corners, we make it more palatable to the investors, we make it more suitable for PayPal to do KYC, we uh, introduce controls so that the IMF is more comfortable with it, we make it so that they are more and more comfortable with it, um, which makes it less and less effective. Um, Bitcoin doesn't get attacked, if it doesn't threaten anything. So one way to stop it from getting attacked is to make it completely unthreatening it by removing its fangs, by, um, by disarming it, by making it useless. Um, and that can only happen from the inside. That can only happen by capitulation of the principles by those who are invested in it and who decides that in the end, this wasn't about creating a system where we don't have rulers. Um, in the end, this wasn't about creating a system without intermediaries. In the end, it was simply about replacing the, um, intermediate, the corrupt intermediaries, rulers, and controllers of the past with me, or you, or whoever else, um, because that's greed, right? And so when people say, um, how about we just make me in charge and then we don't need to worry about not having anyone in charge, that's, that's how these systems fail. Honestly, at this point, given the fact that the recipe of Bitcoin, the concept, its implications, and the ideas and principles behind it have become so widespread and so easy to replicate, I think that that kills Bitcoin but it doesn't kill the movement that Bitcoin started. If the community capitulates its principles, um, all that will do is they'll get replaced by a system that doesn't capitulate those principles. Um, some other system manages to be more principled than Bitcoin and becomes the new Bitcoin. Uh, and in, in many ways, as I've said before, there is a strong possibility at that point that we simply name this new system Bitcoin and pretend that nothing changed. Yeah. The brand itself might survive the instance of the technology um, if it still carries the principles. Okay, awesome. I think that's a great place to end. Um, so it's the principles that are the, the biggest risk to Bitcoin. And even then, the Bitcoin brand might outsurvive the the people that are doing what uh, implementing their principles into what we today call Bitcoin. 
Um, so Andreas, I really thank you for your time. Um, whenever it comes to these uh, technical subjects, I, strong, I strongly recommend everyone check out all your content. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for the service that you've done to uh, Bitcoin and the industry as an educator and just helping people understand so many of these complex subjects over the years. So thanks, Andreas. Thank, thank you, Sam. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity and for all of the work you've done as well. Uh, it's been fun collaborating with you on this project. Simon Dixon back again, and I hope you enjoyed that recording. I really hope you persisted through some of the technical jargon. Um, Andreas is brilliant at articulating things, but sometimes it can get a bit technical, but I hope you push through and the fact that you got this far, let me know in the comments section below exactly what you think. Maybe there's some objections that you have that you'd like us to tackle in future videos. Um, we're also really happy that Andreas has actually agreed to be one of our guest experts on the Retirement Plan B program. Um, so we wanted Andreas to actually cover more on the security part of how to actually secure your own Bitcoin. So if you're interested in that, remember to check out www.retirementplanb.com. Um, and Andreas has actually agreed he's never associated himself with a course outside of university, uh, but he's agreed to be one of the guest experts for that. Um, also remember, if you enjoyed this video and you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell symbol and then hit all because then YouTube will give you all of the notifications each and every time we go live and record the future episodes of Bitcoin Hard Talk and cover everything else. Um, if you've got a comment or a question you'd like to ask, take it in the comment section below this video or follow me on Twitter at Simon Dixon Twit. So always remember, you are alive at one of the most interesting times in financial history. It's going to be really hard for some, great for others, and I want you to be on the right side of that change. Peace.